tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I kissed her floor when I came home. That's the first thing I did. Relief and gratitude as forced out residents return after wildfire got too close for comfort. Plus, why officer involved shootings are going up and what experts say needs to change. 185,000 eggs at a time. So you can imagine how much these can expand in the BC coast. And getting a handle on these, how an invasive crab is threatening BC's marine habitats. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Bath. Relief tonight for people forced from their homes by the Karameas Creek wildfire in the Okanagan Similkameen. They're now allowed to return after being displaced for a week. And as Brady Strachan reports, many in one Olala neighborhood hope the worst of the fire emergency is over. A joyous reunion after a forced vacation. Glad to be home. Fred and Susan Fitzgerald and their dog Tia have spent the last week living in a camping trailer parked in a friend's orchard. Gives you a whole new outlook on the importance of neighbors and friends and, and um, the goodness of people around you. One week ago, the Karameas Creek wildfire forced the Fitzgeralds and their neighbors in Olala to flee. The burning came over the top of that ridge top of the mountain. Now they're eager to see what shape their home is in and if the plants in their garden have survived a week without water. Home is sweet home, eh? Oh. For 94-year-old Albert Bourgeois, getting the order to leave last week was unsettling. It's the son of my gun when he chased you from your home, you know? Takes your feet right out of you. He spent a week in a cramped motel room, wondering if he would even have a home to return to. When we came home, like I said, I opened the door and I kissed the floor and I said, I pay come home. Many living here say they retired in Olala to enjoy the beauty of the valley and the quiet pace of life here. But this past week has shown them how quickly that can change. And they're thankful for the work of firefighters who saved their neighborhood. Hey, everybody here is safe and has still have their homes, so that's what's important. Yeah, a new perspective can always be good. Newfound perspectives and gratitude that the place they call home is still standing. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Karameas. And good news for residents of Olala who have been allowed to ho return home. Uh, the Karameas fire, though, does continue to threaten the Apex Village. Crews remain stationed along Green Mountain Road fighting the blaze, which is estimated to be 6,712 hectares in size. Part of their attack today included a planned ignition in hopes of depriving the fire of fuel. BC Wildfire Service says the burn may increase smoke around the area. In the coming days, crews will be watching the forecast closely as temperatures are expected to rise. Uh, meteorologist mm -hmm. Johanna Wagstaff is with us now. And Joe, I know you're watching that thunder and lightning and wind pretty closely. What are we seeing? Anita, things are really firing up tonight across the interior. I want to take you straight to the watches and warnings. We have been under a widespread thunderstorm watch, uh, watch for a huge swath of the interior up towards Williams Lake. For the better part of the day, I'm just seeing that watch ending up towards Prince George, but that live lightning detector showing you where those active storms are. And here's a look at that uh, radar. So sliding from the southwest towards the northeast, we have seen hundreds of lightning strikes today. And that is coming with some downpours. And as you mentioned, some erratic and gusty winds. It's one of those situations where we're hoping we get more downpours than new fire starts and gusty winds. But crews have been watching uh, this setup for days. And in fact, in anticipation of these thunderstorms, uh, BC Wildfire Service is in what's called a high initial attack readiness. So initial attack crews and aircraft have been stationed strategically across the province where lightning is expected. And over the next couple of days, we'll be watching to see how many new fire starts we've had, because this is the kind of situation, Anita, where we could be looking at dozens of new fires tomorrow, especially when this is a fire danger rating today. A lot of orange and red on there. But again, crews knew this setup was coming. Uh, so it's a bit of a wait and see before we get into that next round of heat. And I'll time that one out a little bit later on in the show. Okay, we'll talk to you soon, Joe. Thank you. You're welcome.
A mudslide has closed a roughly 36-kilometer stretch of Highway 1 in both directions between Lytton and Spence's Bridge. The slide occurred between Highway 8 and Highway 12. No detour is available at this time. After the devastating wildfires that destroyed the village of Lytton last year, that section of the highway was identified as being at risk of landslides and flooding by the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations. The same stretch of road was destroyed by a mudslide during last year's record-breaking rainfall and flooding. Drive BC says a slope assessment is ongoing and an update is expected tomorrow. <laughs> Neighbors in the building where the body of an Indigenous girl was found say there had been warning signs that a tenant in the SRO was dangerous. As Michelle Gassoub reports, other residents say their warnings went ignored. Now, this story discusses violence against Indigenous girls and a warning that some of the details are disturbing. Outside the apartment where the body of 14-year-old Noelle Soup was found in May, a memorial has begun to wilt. But neighbours in the building say they have few answers to what happened in apartment 16 at 405 Heatley Avenue. The stench was months, months and months and months of that smell. This neighbour has been living in the building for five years. The CBC agreed to keep her identity confidential because she was concerned for her safety. She was among the tenants who raised concerns about the smell coming from the apartment where three bodies were discovered. The remains of Osoup and an unidentified woman were found in May. But that was months after the tenant, a man in his 40s, was found in the same small apartment. To the character of the person who lived there, being associated with a 14-year-old child was revolting. He was not a person who should have been around a 14-year-old girl. She says the tenant of apartment 16, nicknamed Kim, was frightening. She describes other incidents that worried her when he brought another young woman to the building. She was locked in the washroom, apparently been there for two hours, and he was pounding on the door hysterically. I live in a suite down the hall and over and I could hear him. I don't know about the second woman who was found, but I hope to hell it was not that woman. The woman found alongside Osoup has not been identified. The building manager declined to speak to us today. Vancouver police said in a statement they don't have the authority to search the home of a person who died of natural causes or of a drug overdose and have said the man's death is not considered suspicious. But building residents say it's unacceptable that two bodies went undiscovered for so long. The loss of Osoup especially painful because this woman's son is missing too. Her parents must be broken. Her people must be broken. I am missing my own. There's a missing piece there. Still more questions than answers about how a little girl slipped out of sight and was found here. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. The province's police watchdog says B.C. has seen a sharp increase in police-involved shootings this year. They're up more than double on average compared to years prior. The CBC's Josh Grant joins us now. And Josh, you've been going through the data. What do we know about this surge? Anita, so far this year, the Independent Investigations Office has opened 15 investigations into police-involved shootings. That's more than double their usual average of seven investigations. Just Saturday, a suspect wielding a machete was shot by police in an SRO on the Granville Strip. That's the latest incident where someone was killed or seriously injured during a police interaction. The IIO doesn't point to a direct cause for the overall spike, but they do tell me they've seen an increase in weapons being carried by alleged criminals. With respect to the officer-involved shooting cases, um, we have seen an unusual number of times in those cases where the individual who winds up being shot was armed um, with a, a firearm. Um, and um, that's not something that we normally see. So reading between the lines, that seems to suggest violent crime is causing police to potentially react violently. Is that what police are saying? Well, the VPD is making a strong statement. It says it's had four officer-involved shootings since April and, quote, these four shootings have involved our officers facing threats to their lives or to lives of members of the public. The shootings were necessary to prevent additional members of the public or police officers from being seriously injured or killed. 
But one former police chief I spoke with says it's not enough to just react to violence with violence. We need to get to the root causes with new approaches. Yes, violent offenders, I strongly believe they should be incarcerated, thrown in jail, and maybe some of them throw the key away. But there's such an array of other offenders that need to be treated differently, whether it's through uh, some type of harm reduction, some type of treatment, or some type of emotional uh, health issue that needs to be addressed. Now, we've also seen an ongoing debate about defunding the police. One criminologist says police need training that goes beyond de-escalation. What needs to happen is that we need to reconstruct the police. And so these initiatives that are devoted to having trauma-informed policing, that is, police officers who have had training in frontline trauma and know how to respond to it, Weissman says community groups need more resources and that police need to include people like teachers, social and intervention workers in their prevention efforts and in the way they respond to certain crimes. The CBC's Josh Grant reporting tonight. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Anita. Well, just three days after a City of Vancouver crew started dismantling tent encampments along East Hastings Street, little has changed on Vancouver's downtown east side. Advocates and residents say they've been pressing for a housing plan and calling on authorities to answer. But as Leanne Young reports, few officials have been willing to speak out or offer help. Vince Ta was there on Tuesday as city crews started cleaning up East Hastings Street. Among the crowd of community members, police, fire crews, media and activists like himself, he wondered. Where's BC Housing? Where's David Eby, right? Minister, former Minister of Housing, future Premier. They're gone. And they haven't said a thing about what's going on out there. And I think that's quite damning. Since the fire order was issued on July 25th, Few elected officials from the province or city have spoken to CBC about the decampment, aside from sending statements. Questions have been raised again and again. Where are tent residents expected to go without a housing plan? CBC News has asked the city of Vancouver repeatedly for interviews and those plans. Its media department has deferred the question to BC Housing. The provincial agency has only sent emailed statements that read in part, on short notice, we do not have access to large numbers of new spaces in Vancouver to accommodate the timing of the emergency order. A BC Housing vice president was finally slated for an interview today, but cancelled last minute. BC Housing falls under the purview of Murray Rankin, the housing minister. When we requested an interview with him this morning, we were told he was unavailable. But when I reached out to his media department through his other portfolio, Indigenous Relations, I was told he was busy, but he would be available for a phone interview in the afternoon. But by the afternoon, the minister's office had gone silent. And that's deeply problematic that we're dismantling people's homes without any place to go. We're just we're just changing and shifting the problem and in the process really undermining people's human dignity and human rights. BC's Human Rights Commissioner is among those demanding answers from officials. She sent the Housing Minister and Mayor Kennedy Stewart a formal letter with her concerns. She'll get to hear from the mayor tomorrow. He's agreed to an interview on CBC Radio's The Early Edition. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. The Dutch man convicted of sexually extorting BC teenager Amanda Todd will be sentenced next month. Aidan Coban will be sentenced September 20th through the 23rd. Coban is convicted on charges of extortion, two counts of possession of child pornography, child luring and criminal harassment against Amanda Todd. The Coquitlam teen's story got international attention after she died by suicide at the age of 15 nearly a decade ago. Coban was not charged with Todd's death. Now, if you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of suicide, you can get help at the number listed on your screen. Well, an independent investigation has found the Vancouver Whitecaps' response to allegations of misconduct by two former women's coaches was appropriate but didn't go far enough. Major League Soccer hired a law firm last November to review how the team dealt with sexual misconduct allegations against Bob Barada and Hubert Busby Jr. This new report says the investigations were superficial and lacking in depth and that some of the findings seemed overly generous to the former coaches despite the evidence about their misconduct towards players. The former Whitecaps player who first brought the allegations to light says she's skeptical that much will change. 
the biggest hole in the system that I've realized is that there needs to be a group advocating for the athletes and the athletes welfare and have that be the primary and, and, you know, and then there's a balance, right. Where like the athletes interests are being protected and the organization's interests are being protected. Whitecaps CEO Axel Schuster says it's clear the club could have done better and it's truly sorry. He adds it is committed to becoming a leader in safe sport. Well, the hunt is on across the south coast to trap and track an invasive crustacean. The European green crab has spread to the Salish Sea in recent years, threatening BC's marine habitats. As Isabel Regam explains, volunteers are now being asked to get certified to help monitor the population. Unlike most crabbers, a big catch is bad news for this group of volunteers going in with teams and trying to remove as many as they can. Good news would be finding not a single one of these European green crabs in Boundary Bay. Unfortunately, we have, we have found uh, more than enough uh, green crab to say that there is a concern here. A concern because it's an invasive species known to outcompete native crabs for resources and damage critical habitats. Is they tear up the eelgrass beds when they're searching for their food. The other crabs don't do that. And the eelgrass is really important for the ecosystem because it's kind of the nursery area for a lot of the small fish, even our salmon. The Department of Fisheries and Ocean says the green crab arrived in West Coast waters in the late 80s, starting in San Francisco. In the decades since, they've reached Oregon, Washington State, likely attached to boats, eventually arriving on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the late 90s. But only in the last few years have they been reported in the Strait of Georgia. They're not established all across our coastlines. They are in pockets. So let's keep them there. It's why groups across BC are reporting sightings of the crab recognizable by five distinct spines near its eyes. The Invasive Species Council of BC offers an online certification that's required by the DFO to trap and remove the crabs from our waters. 185,000 eggs at a time. So you can imagine how much these can expand in the BC coast. In the years to come, researchers believe measures will have to be taken to manage the population and minimize its impacts, as eradicating them from BC shores is unlikely. There's no silver bullet. Uh, now that the crab is here, it, we're going to learn to live with it. Part of living with it is reminding boaters to watch for creatures that may hitch a ride and asking for volunteers to help spot the green crab. Isabel Regam, CBC News, Vancouver. For the first time since the start of the pandemic, animal adoptions are down. That's according to the BCSPCA. It says the number of people looking to adopt a pet has taken a nosedive in recent months. It's a stark contrast to the height of the pandemic when shelters across BC were flooded with adoption applications. According to locations in the Lower Mainland, the slowdown today applies to all types of animals, including once popular puppies and kittens. Uh, there were times during the height of the pandemic where we had absolutely no dogs for adoption and very few small animals for adoption. And the tables have turned in that quite significantly. We're, we're not only seeing higher numbers of animals in care, we're seeing higher requests for owner surrendered animals, more animals with uh, behavioral issues and requirements for veterinary care, and then compounded by uh, less of an, a, a demand for adoption specifically. The BCSPCA says it currently has more than 1,500 animals in its care. The group urges anyone interested in adopting to visit its website and view the animals in need of a good home. As he does, our Justin McElroy has been following key mayoral races in the province ahead of the October elections. Today, a look at Port Coquitlam and its increasingly popular mayor, who is currently running unopposed. When it comes to its size, to its diversity, to its type of uh, homes, Port Coquitlam is fairly nondescript in Metro Vancouver demographically. But when it comes to its mayor, it's anything but that. Four years ago, Brad West won with 86% of the vote, the most of any first-time mayor in British Columbia facing competition. And since then, he's proven to be popular on social media and with enough people around the province that his name was floated as a potential leadership candidate for the NDP this year. 
Now, he declined that opportunity, and just this week, he announced he would be seeking a second term as mayor of Port Coquitlam, at this point facing no competition for the job. Now, you might wonder what makes someone so popular where they managed to get more than 85% of the vote and face no competition in Metro Vancouver. Well, when West describes it, a big part of it is focusing on the basics. And so we've got new parks, new playgrounds, spray parks, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, uh, water and sewer utilities, lighting, uh, crosswalks, uh, pedestrian activated flashers, you know, stuff that it may not be super exciting, but is the nuts and bolts of a municipality. So what would a second term look like for West? Well, he says that he would lobby TransLink for rapid transit to come to his community, higher levels of government for the infrastructure replacement for the aging Coquitlam River Bridge, and as well focused on the continued revitalization of downtown, which recently had a new community center built. There have been rumors all along that even despite him saying no to running for leadership of the NDP this year, that higher levels of office are in his ambition long term. I asked him if he could guarantee Port Coquitlam residents that he would serve his full term if elected? He said absolutely. Now comes the hard or easy part, depending on his lack of competition, winning this October. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Port Coquitlam. The Chilliwack Sunflower Festival has returned for its fifth year in a row, but it all looks a little different this year. Our Yasmin Gandam tells us why. So flowers are key to my lifestyle. Kate Onos Gilbert lives and breathes flowers. So the disappointment set in upon having to push this year's festival back by five weeks because of weather. What's happened this year is these guys um, are actually slightly behind the ones that were planted two weeks ago because of the, the stress that they endured from being planted so in the cold and wet. There are more than 40 to 50 variations of the sunflower planted here, but rain has meant some are still in bloom. The one here, which has the big mound in the middle, is full of developing seeds that have started to grow seeds inside the middle. This one over here is just coming into bloom, and the seeds in the flat center that you can see in there are not forming yet until it fully opens, and then they will start developing their seeds. But she's still optimistic. By next week, this time, this will be a full sea of yellow. It's not all a waiting game. Visitors are able to roam around the almost eight acres of land. On at least half the property, the flowers look like this. Some of these flowers can grow up to four meters tall, but only if the weather is right. Despite this year's challenges, people are still walking through the fields, taking photos and even celebrating big milestone events. It's a perfect occasion to celebrate my birthday here. I'm just here with my family, with my parents who are visiting from uh, Ontario. Actually, it's their anniversary, so we're here for the day. Being here with friends. <laughs> yeah. Spending time. Spending time together, yeah. The festival in Chilliwack is open until September 5th. Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, Vancouver. They know their line of work comes with risks, but now firefighters say their jobs are increasingly unsafe and becoming much harder. After the break, we speak live with the vice president of the Vancouver Firefighters Union. Stay with us. Thanks for watching our commercial-free live stream. A Toronto man has charted a 27-kilometer, mostly off-road cycling loop through the city's Scarborough area. Jimmy Judgy hopes his route will get more people of different backgrounds exploring the outdoors on two wheels. <laughs> about some of the, the trails because we're going to ride one today. What's, yeah. What do you like about this particular trail out here by Morningside Park? Uh, we call this the uh, Scarborough South Loop, uh, which is primarily an off-road ride. It's about a 27 kilometer loop that takes you through about 11 different parks in Scarborough along the waterfront. I love your motto, be nice, ride a bike, Yes. repeat. Be nice, ride a bike, repeat. Expand on that. <laughs> you know, for us it's the importance of inclusion. We want folks to feel like they have a place, mm -hmm. a place in the cycling world, a place in outdoor adventures. Those of us who uh, identify as people of color and minorities, uh, sometimes there isn't a space uh, to be outdoors, to be you know on our bicycles, oh, on two-wheel adventures. It's not welcoming. 
Certainly, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head, Dwight. Uh, we want to make sure that people feel welcomed and friendly, so try to be nice and wave and ride your bike and repeat. So, this is where it gets good, boys. <laughs> Uh, it involves getting lost a lot on your bicycle and figuring out how to connect different routes um, and then just document it, put it together um, and make sure that people have like the supportive features, whether write-ups, pictures, tips uh, to navigate that route safely. Like we were trying to figure out different ways to piece this loop together for quite literally three years. Yeah, because and that's the thing about it, a lot of the writing, it's the transitions. Yes. Right, I feel like I'm on some secret mission here that nobody else knows about. <laughs> Except we want to share it, you know? Yeah, too good not to share. Okay, see? We want to make sure that we can make this easy for you. Mm -hmm. You know, give you everything that you need to just get on your bike, put your helmet on and say, you know, I got this, the drive side Scarborough South loop map. Uh, I'm ready for adventure. You smile when you talk about this. Like, yes. Why, why do you love this so much? What, what, it's just the exhilaration of being out in the open. What do you love about it so much, dude? You know, I think, um, I think cycling adventures provide such an avenue for folks to um, have an escape, uh, to have fun, uh, to practice mental health, uh, just to get a little break sometimes. And we especially love uh, showing folks uh, the magic of Scarborough and what this place means to the city and what it means to us. Well, we love the fact that you've set up this site and you're helping us enjoy these trails and helping us enjoy Scarborough. Yeah, it is a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's return to one of our top stories and take a broader look at safety concerns for first responders. Vancouver firefighters say they are responding to more violent calls involving people with mental health issues. Now they're calling for government investment, more of it, in mental health and addiction support. This is in the wake of last weekend's machete attack on Granville Street and during a week of violence on the downtown east side as city staff started removing tents and other structures that have propped up over the weeks. Fire crews say clearing East Hastings is necessary because of a number of safety concerns. For more, we have Lee Lax with us, Vice President of the Vancouver Firefighters Union. Lee, what are you hearing from firefighters about the challenges they're facing right now? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us on. You know, first off, you know, on Saturday, Saturday was really a culmination of you know, a very uh, busy time of, of year and a busy year for, for firefighters. Uh, you know, we're extremely grateful that, you know, the firefighters that were, you know, part of a, a pretty traumatic scene on, on Saturday night are, are safe. Uh, what we're seeing on the street day to day is, is increasing, you know, the struggles of, you know, members of our community. Um, the, the state of, you know, many, uh, you know, areas of, uh, of the city, um, and, and the struggles that some of our citizens are seeing are, is getting to the point where it's unsustainable for you know, communities, the province, the federal government to look at first responders as being the first line of defense. What is it exactly that firefighters are seeing that's making them or experiencing that's making them feel unsafe when they're responding to some of these calls? Well, the, you know, if I go back to the incident on, on Saturday evening, you know, as firefighters, we're, we're here to help. And, you know, when we're faced with, uh, you know, an incident where, you know, a, a person is struggling and, uh, and a weapon is, uh, is wielded to, you know, first responders who good-heartedly approach this incident to, to try and help, that, that's going to have an impact. And, and the impact, uh, you know, for some of those firefighters uh, on Saturday night, you know, many of them were really early on in their career. And, you know, this is going to leave a lasting mark you know, as they, you know, show up and, and have signed up for this job to help people. No doubt. And that incident on Saturday that you're referring to just for our viewers is the machete attack that happened along the Granville Strip with multiple people injured and firefighters responded. Um, you know, you're calling on governments to do more. What exactly do you want to happen here? What exactly would help? 
Yeah, I think first off, we have to have a realization that the municipalities can't uh, bear the the total weight of this. You know, we are the front line of service for for many communities, but you know, a lot of these issues are are, are deeply rooted in in mental health, in, in housing issues, where uh, we need the provincial government and federal government to you know to come down and see you know exactly the situation many of areas of Vancouver are faced with. You know, we've heard continued problem. Um, commitments from the, the province and the federal government around mental health and, you know, the rapid establishment of, of more housing. But, you know, we need to see all three levels of government quickly get to the table and, and discuss some of these emerging issues. Lee Lax is with the Vancouver Firefighters Union joining us live tonight. Thanks for being with us, Lee. You're quite welcome. The need for blood donors is constant in this country, but there's another kind of donation that's facing ever-growing demand, plasma. Now, plasma requires a specific donation process, and it's used to make life-saving drugs. Renee Filipponi takes us through a controversial solution. You're Ryan? I am. This is your first time donating plasma? It, is. it may be in you to give, but plasma donations in Canada fall far below the need. That's why Canadian Blood Services is considering partnering with private firms that pay for donations. Fundamentally, this is problematic because Canadian Blood Services hasn't been transparent. This critic says getting big corporations involved is the wrong way to go. There is no reason to undermine our voluntary uh, voluntary donor base and securing our own plasma supply through our national blood operator in order to sell it off to private industry. Okay. Canada only collects 15% of the plasma it needs. It's a component of blood donated separately that is used to make life-saving drugs. After your donation, you'll be compensated for your time. The rest comes from the U.S., where donors can make more than $800 a month for regular visits. We have no example, not anywhere in the world, not one jurisdiction that manages to collect enough plasma to meet the need of their patient communities unless they compensate donors. In a statement, Canadian Blood Services says we are working to reduce Canada's dependency on the global market, but will ensure plasma donated in Canada stays in Canada. And get paid for your contribution. A number of provinces already have private compensation for plasma donations, including Alberta, Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, where people can make up to $65 a visit. Some of that plasma is then sold abroad. Payment is banned in BC, Ontario and Quebec. The idea of that changing is a turnoff to some regular donors. It goes against the whole um, idea of, of donation of, you know, being, doing a good deed, in effect. Canadian Blood Services is opening up new plasma donation centres across the country, but say it's not enough. Any new paid plasma operation will need authorization by Health Canada. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Buying a home in Canada is changing. High prices and rising interest rates have forced some to think of unconventional ways of paying to put a roof over their heads. That's coming up next. tortuous and treacherous, kicking horse pass in the Canadian Rockies. It's here that an 80-mile stretch of forbidding mountains straddling the Alberta-British Columbia boundary presents the last major obstacle to a century-old dream, the Trans-Canada Highway. Stephen, British Columbia, where the highway will cross the Great Continental Divide at an altitude of 5,000 feet. This section is by far the trickiest, costliest, and most hazardous to build. Costs have gone up to $300,000 a mile, but the safety record is excellent. The engineers plan a 24-foot pavement with graded gravel shoulders, gentle grades, and smooth curves. That means that sometimes whole sides of mountains must be blasted out.
follows the one-way trail that pushed through the past by miners in the early 1800s. Since the capricious Kicking Horse River winds its swaying course back and forth from one side of the canyon to the other, 22 bridges will be needed in the Kicking Horse Pass stretch alone. Although this is the most challenging section of the Trans-Canada Highway, the road itself is still far from completion. 60% of it must yet be constructed. The 5,000-mile highway is expected to be finished in 1961. Quebec province, which is not participating, the project is a joint federal-provincial effort. Construction is not yet underway on two stretches of more than 100 miles each, one in Newfoundland and the other in northern Ontario. The remaining 4,700 miles are considered passable, although almost 2,000 miles are as yet unpaid. dream becomes a reality, like its predecessor, the railway link, Canadian motorists will enjoy a 5,000 mile throughway and pay not a single toll fee. Rapidly rising house prices and quick climbing interest rates have made it increasingly difficult for people to buy a home. Now, the challenges, though, have led to a variety of non-traditional financing options. The CBC's Kirtana Sassitherna takes a look at two unconventional ways of getting into the market. You show us our new house? Lauren Schreiber Sazaki and her family recently moved into her new home, a home she's been waiting to purchase for years. The mom of two was three months out from leaving Toronto. It would have meant starting over. Despite a good paying job for her and her husband and family help, she couldn't get enough for the down payment. But thanks to the help of a Toronto-based company, she got her dream home. We have about a 50-50 split uh, in our down payment, which means that within uh, 10 years, we either have to buy them out or sell the house. It's just a different way of investing. Like, people are still investing in the housing industry, but in a way that also is putting, you know, families into homes. That company is Arbro. We provide a contribution towards a down payment, and in exchange, we have a beneficial interest in the home. The co-ownership lasts 10 years. Arbro shares in the total appreciation of the value of the home. We don't necessarily compare ourselves as an alternative to a bank, but more so an alternative to the bank of mom and dad. Colvern acknowledges it's not a traditional means to get a house. So it's not about putting your entire life savings into a down payment anymore. You can get into the home with less of a financial risk. And Arbro is there as a co-owner. We give people the opportunity to have less mortgage or to have a less leveraged property. But for some, home ownership isn't the end goal. They just want a way to enter the real estate market, whether it's to build a portfolio or grow a passive income. This is uh, one of our first two buildings. Um, this is 356 Queen Street. Kevin Huynh is the chief investment officer at Willow, a stock market for real estate. They buy property and split the equity into thousands of units, which people can buy and earn dividends on. There's not a lot of people who can afford to buy this building on their own. Um, having the ability to have it in smaller pieces does make it accessible for someone looking to make their journey into real estate investing. While the ideas are innovative, one expert says it's important to be cautious of the risks. Buyers will have to work out for themselves whether they whether they work for them, given that sellers are going to need to have due diligence about the houses that they're owning. The seller's perspective matters too, and if the sellers are facing risks, they're going to offer the buyers contracts that are less attractive, and it'll be harder for the product to take off. For Lauren, while she knows it's not the most conventional way of owning a home, she says for her family, the unconventional way worked best. It's a place where I don't have to worry about being rent evicted. It's a place where I can invest in, in my home. Kirtan Asasi there in CBC News, Toronto.
An extreme heat warning has come into effect in parts of the UK today for the next four days. The amber level warning is the second most severe level. Temperatures are expected to hit the upper 30s in some areas. And as Katie Nicholson tells us, it comes just after last month's record-breaking heat wave. Call them hot weather heroes. A small team bringing cool air to a stifling British flat. Very hot, very hot, um, particularly in this room. Just as another extreme heat warning settles in like an unwelcome guest. In parks, a strong whiff of hay permeates the air from the sun-bleached grass. Waterways run low. And in a scene more common in North America, police smash the window of a locked car to free a dog inside just in time. Living in the UK, we're not aware of, of how hot it actually can get, and we're not prepared for that. This AC installation, a rare attempt to get ready. It's estimated fewer than 5% of homes in the UK have AC. Just walk down this street shows no units jutting out of homes. But as the temperatures increase, so does the demand. For the past month, I've been doing overtime like crazy, so we have been busy, which is good. It's making so hot, like in Europe, like, we feel like we are not in England, we are in Europe. Eight years ago, Rob would install one unit a day. That's changed. Actually, on the summer, we do three, four, how much we can. Ready? Yeah. But with every new AC installation, the demand for energy goes up. They, they, it will have an impact because we still use a lot of fossil fuels. That, that impact is quite, uh, quite significant. The cost of air conditioning will likely keep it out of reach for most, he says. And Britons will just have to suffer through without. After all, for centuries, heat was not the enemy. We have 70 times the number of people dying from the cold than we do dying from the heat. Uh, but the consequence of this is we just haven't really designed our buildings to cope with overheating. This is the first year the UK introduced regulations to build homes that don't overheat. A little late for this heat wave. And so it's the outdoors, the shade and the sea for the majority without AC. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, London. The UN Security Council called a special meeting to discuss the war in Ukraine. The members received a briefing from the head of the organization's nuclear agency about fighting near a nuclear power plant, which is the largest in Europe. I reiterate that the military actions that have even the smallest potential to jeopardize nuclear safety or nuclear security at such a nuclear installation must stop immediately. The head of the IAEA has warned that the situation at the plant is getting more dangerous every day. He wants to send in a team of inspectors to monitor operations and ensure its safety. The facility is under Russian control, but it's still being operated by Ukrainian staff. The U.S. Justice Department has asked a court to unseal the search warrant used in the FBI raid on the Florida home of former President Donald Trump. The department filed the motion to make public the warrant and receipt in light of the former president's public confirmation of the search, the surrounding circumstances, and the substantial public interest in this matter. Attorney General Merrick Garland says he personally approved the warrant for Monday morning raid at Mar-a-Lago. It's part of an ongoing investigation into classified White House records recovered from Trump's home earlier this year. It's not known if or when the request to release the documents might be granted. Well, they call her Frosty, a rare white orca traveling through B.C. waters with her mother. Coming up, we'll speak with a biologist about this special whale and where you can see her. And take a look at this. You can't really see the fish. Oh, there it is in the bear's mouth. It just caught a salmon at Alaska's Katmai National Park. It is 6.43 and you're looking at that shot right now. This is known as the best place in the world to watch brown bears feast on spawning salmon. I sure can't argue that, just incredible. Three bears we saw and now a close up of this one right here, beautiful. Okay, if you can take your eyes off this, Johanna will be here next with our full forecast.
Most trans people I know, if they're on dating apps, all have horror stories. There's a lot to break down there. 15 pictures of his genitals. That's not a way to open the door. But what do I do with that? It's a little intense, if you ask me. <laughs> 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 There's nothing to bite into. It's just a little bit strange to me. That is so specific, but I'm into it. Oh, sorry. I'm a little distracted right now. I just matched with this really cute person and Trying to use dating apps as a trans person can be so frustrating. We have to deal with rude comments, invasive questions, and so many people asking about our genitals. Ah. It's like people need some kind of crash course in how to talk to trans folks. Like some kind of casual, approachable video where we could hear from real trans people about their dating experiences. Someone should really make something like that. So you've matched with a gorgeous, gorgeous trans person on your dating app of choice. And now it's time to send the opening message. It's no secret that first impressions are everything. So what's the right thing to say? A good opening line for me would be something that references my profile. I find people don't read people's profiles enough. And so I specifically made something on mine that says, ask me about being, and I listed a bunch of things. So it's like, I'm an autistic human. I do drag. I'm a bartender. I do tattoos. So just ask me about one of them. People are people. Trans people are just a different kind of people. Um, and any, the, any way you approach anyone should always be respectful and interesting. So if I say like, hey, I'm, I'm queer, I'm non-binary, I work in games, I have an interest in film, I write, you know, just anything that's about me, I would love for them to comment on it. They're always the best, the ones that don't jump straight into, you know, wanting to get into bed with me or something. I would say the unsolicited dick pictures are probably just like the worst things to have to go through. Cause it's like, well, what do I do with that? Some people will get like almost really sexual off the start. Like I got this one time, this one guy, he decided to send me uh, 15 genital pictures in different angles. Why do I need 15 pictures? Like, are you trying to create a stop motion movie, dude? As someone who is a demisexual person, meaning I don't really have sexual attraction to somebody unless I have an emotional connection, throwing something sexual at me right away is gonna get you nowhere. The key thing is if you want like a hot tip, ask a question, something that invites a conversation. Because if you just give me a statement or worse, you just say, hey, you're hot. Like there's nothing to bite into. The best ones are the ones that like catch you off guard where you're like, Oh, like, I remember someone being like, are you the HTTP to my colon backslash backslash? That is so specific, but I'm into it. And then they didn't keep messaging me, so I didn't keep to... A very special visitor hit up the shores of Telegraph Cove. There she blows. The one on the left is a rare white transient orca, or more affectionately known as Frosty or Frostbite. She came all the way from California with her mother. And beside her there, they journeyed 2,000 kilometers away from home after they branched out from their family. Well, exciting to witness, the man who filmed Frosty and Mum says he was first concerned about what they were doing in their shallow waters. They spent quite a bit of time just circling around, um, almost an hour where they just circled, but they, they porpoised together every time, which indicated to us they're, they're doing okay. They're obviously a pair. Frostbite and her mother eventually swam away toward Alert Bay. Still, how the pair made their way from California to BC's coast has surprised orca researchers. And for more on this, we are live with a transient orca specialist who's been tracking Frostbite's family from Monterey, California. Josh McInnes joins us from UBC. Thanks for being with us, Josh. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, how do you think the pair actually ended up here and how surprising is it? Well, it's really interesting. Um, our last sighting of this group was actually in the Farallon Islands, California in June. Uh, so not too long ago, they were off of the offshore waters. And what's interesting is that this group in particular are part of what we believe to be like an outer coast population of 
transient orcas, so groups that spend time in deep water. And we believe that they kind of focus on following areas near the shelf, the continental shelf break or canyons and that, similar to where their um, typical area of Monterey is, where there's a deep water canyon there. So likely they kind of made their way up the coast, probably on the outside of Vancouver Island, then moved their way uh, through the through around the north end of the island. But so if they are known to be in deep waters, these whales were spotted in shallow waters by the coast. What does that tell you about their behavior? Uh, it just tells us there's a lot that we don't know. I mean, we what we realize is that there's this West Coast population of transients that are distributed from Southeast Alaska, basically to Southern California. And what we believe to be two subpopulations, uh, one being an inner coast or a coastal group that we see predominantly around Vancouver Island and, and Washington State that focuses on shallow waters and then an outer coast group that seems to be more off Oregon and California, uh, but they occasionally intermix, but they also have, are very much geographically separate. Um, the two whales here is frostbite and the, her mother, um, we know as OCT 50. So basically that's the number we give them as researchers and uh, the OCT 50 C is the mother and OCT 50 C one would be uh, frostbite. How common is this white coloration among orcas? Like how many white whale sightings have you actually gathered? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's uncommon, but it does happen. I mean, the first um, all white killer whales were seen in the 40s and 50s um, off Vancouver Island. And it actually one of the most famous killer whales was Chimo, uh, who was actually at the um, sea land of the Pacific in Victoria. And that animal had a rare um, genetic disorder that call it, caused it to be albino. But not all white killer whales or white individual animals are actually albino. Some could be leucistic, which is like a white uh, pigmentation uh, or lack of melanism from a protein. And some animals like we had in 2018, we had a calf born in the inner coast transients named Taluk, who was um, a white killer whale that actually has been declared missing um, in 2020, but was also white. And then this animal frostbite, our OCT 50 C1, popped up in 2019, uh, was born off California. So it does happen. Wow, super interesting. You know, I understand frostbite and her mother broke off from their Californian family. Is that a big deal in terms of what we know about the social structure of orca populations? And I'm curious, will they be able to find their family again? Yeah, no, it's very common with transients. Um, their social structure is very different from the resident killer whales. Uh, and this has to do with their prey. Often there are specialists that coordinate hunting. So when groups get to a certain size, um, often you see fragmentation. So when females um, have their own calves, they'll often leave their mother's pod to form their own matriline or family. Uh, but occasionally they'll come back together and associate. But um, we start to see this kind of uh, pattern where females will take off with their own. Actually, her sister, um, OCT50C, or uh, the mother, her sister actually is also fragmented off from the major uh, pod. And sometimes the two sisters will travel together. Um, but we'll likely start to see them back in California or off Oregon um, once, uh, once uh, in the next couple of months, likely. Fascinating stuff. And we've had a lot of whale and cetacean sightings this year, for sure. Josh McInnes is a transient orca specialist from the Mammal Research Unit at UBC. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now wearing white like the, yes. like the uh, orca there. <laughs> just a transient orca whale. Yeah. <laughs> just picking up on those vibes. That was so interesting. I feel like I, lot of, I learned a lot, not just about the colors, but the, the social structures. I'm really glad you asked about their reuniting Anita yeah I you know I'm curious because as humans and I think orcas can often act like humans from what I hear you know yeah. you want to be near your family maybe uh so it is curious <laughs> for sure exactly I like the part about the two sisters will go on a trip at some point mm -hmm. uh and I've got a great forecast Anita for uh, everyone looking to head out to the waters this weekend uh, maybe meet up with a family member for a little vacation. We are, of course, still watching that lightning in the interior, but this is sort of the weekend before the heat really builds, and we might even get a few stray showers, which would be nice. Uh, let me take you to the satellite and radar and the lightning uh, detector. Kamloops, what a storm. You have just had uh, several uh, cloud-to-ground lightning strikes reported in Kamloops, some good downpours as well, hearing some reports of that uh, leveling the Mattis cloud as well. But the thunderstorm's still going tonight. So if you are in the interior uh, up towards Prince George, take cover through the evening. These storms might rumble for a few more hours, hoping that we do get some good downpours. We have another risk of those thunderstorms tomorrow afternoon, not as great or widespread as today. But here is a snapshot of 5 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, the accumulated rainfall. We may get some more downpours, but with that, some more lightning strikes. I mentioned earlier, we'll really have to wait and see 
uh, how many new fire starts we end up with uh, after all is said and done. And it will be said and done as we do head into Sunday. Things really become more stable. And that's in advance of the next high pressure system that builds in. So watch those oranges start to punch up beginning Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's the time span of the next heat wave for Southern BC. I think we'll see uh, some kind of heat warnings for Southern BC. Our overnight lows look to stay up to the high teens. So we might get those for that. We might get that heat warning for Metro Vancouver. I'll keep you posted. Again, that's early next week. 25 and through Victoria, hitting the 29s up towards places like Campbell River, Comox, hoping for a few showers across the south coast. Be nice to just get a little blip Friday night into Saturday morning. Clearing out though for early next week, those are YVR temperatures, so inland hitting the 30s. Again, we'll watch those overnight lows, but I need a nice couple of next few days where it's not too hot, no severe weather, kind of a calm before the heat storm. Just a little in the middle. Thanks, Joe. A little in the middle. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, this is an app for ferry sailings in BC without the support of BC Ferries. The unsanctioned app is sailing uncharted territories, so to speak. We tell you how it came to be next. This is a really special place. The community is amazing. I really haven't been to many places in the world where the community can come together and actually like truly genuinely care about just doing it, not for profit, you know, just, just to help the community. I really hope that this just provides a safe place for, for, for kids and adults alike to go, that they can, uh, you know, expel some energy, a place that people can feel welcome. They have an alternative to, if they're not playing team sports, they have an alternative to come somewhere and have something that they can get things off their chest by cruising around the park and really, uh, yeah, getting that feeling. My role is advisor, designer, builder. The idea that I'm bringing to this one is progression in the beginning, larger things so once you are progressed and better that you can still skate that and or scooter or bike or whatever it may be and you can still do those technical tricks on those smaller things. It's a kid named Cooper, looking to have a skate park built. He wrote a letter and the next thing you know, things move pretty fast because it's an amazing community here. Everyone is really, you know, on board for positive things for kids to have things to do. I just so happen to have worked in that field before. I just wanted to give a hand. The next thing you know, I uh, decided to take this project on. In that culture, people are extremely supportive of each other. Like one person could be, you know, the best skateboarder in the world or scooter, whatever, they're doing their tricks and everyone, they're doing a really difficult trick, people cheer them on and do anything. Next thing you know, somebody that isn't as talented, people are cheering them on exactly the same amount if they're just doing what they're learning at that time. If this place can help one person, then it's worth it. You boys like to scooter, but I like, I'm more of a skater girl. This is actually my favorite pl place on Graham and Ann. At school, we were going to be raising money for this, and we raised enough, so now we have this, and I was very happy because I love skateboarding. They love it. Before we had the skate park, there wasn't much for them to do, but now that we have the skate park, they're here all the time with their friends. <laughs> There's so much for them to do. It varies from ages, from toddler to teenagers, so it's interacting with all different <laughs> age groups of kids. Seeing them, smiles on their face, being active, oh, it's really? awesome. Yeah. And the fact that there was kids that brought this idea to the village to get it, it shows that there wasn't much for kids down here. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. 
Stream your favorite CBC dramas or comedies 24-7 on demand on the CBC Gem app. Plus, you can live stream CBC Vancouver News. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca. And never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. Finally tonight, a Vancouver Island tech developer has built his own version of a BC Ferries mobile app. Samuel Pratt's app is called BC Ferry Times. It lets users see sailing times and capacity levels. Pratt says the app will never be a big moneymaker, but he thinks it's necessary. BC Ferries had planned to make an app since as far back as 2018 and says it should be ready by the end of the year. A great idea indeed, especially in the summer and the holidays. Ferry reservations seems to be booked up weeks in advance, sometimes months. Good call. Okay, that is it for CBC Vancouver News tonight. I am off for a couple days, so I'll see you next week. Leanne and Dan will be filling in. Good night.